Hi, I'm Todd Landman. I'm a professor of political science and I'm the faculty pro vice chancellor for the social sciences here at the University of Nottingham. In addition to being an academic, for most of my life, I've also been a magician. Since the 1970s, I've studied, performed, and practiced magic all over the world. And what I try to do is combine my academic work with the magical world. And in particular, I see magic as a form of communication and a way to expose students and my audiences to a wider set of ideas that might concern us in the human world. And what we've done is prepared a set of videos, which is kind of a series of concepts from the academic world that I illustrate and deliver through the medium of magic. In the first video, you're going to hear me introduce what it is that academics are worried about. We go all the way back to Aristotle and philosophy, and I work with a group of students in the Lakeside Arts Theater here at the university through a series of videos from there. So I hope you enjoy the first one, which I call Academic Magic. Welcome. This is a wonderful time for us to celebrate a little bit of something different. My name is Todd Landman, and I'm an academic magician. And I often wonder about how we can understand the world around us through magic. What does that mean, an academic magician? Well, let me start with three questions. What do we know in the world and how do we know it? So how do you know what you know? Question number one. Question number two, how do I know what you know? Is it possible for me to access what you're thinking? That's question number two. Question number three is what do we know that actually matters? You all know many things. A lot of it has absolutely no consequence whatsoever. You probably know all sorts of things about Facebook, uh, about Twitter, perhaps, about iPads and iPhones, but does all that knowledge really matter? What are the core things that we need to know as human beings that really matter? So my third question is about what is it that we know that actually matters? Let's go back to the first one about how we access information. How do we know what we know? Some people think we do it by observation alone, that we don't really know anything until we can see it. This is a kind of a pure empiricist argument, that we can only talk about things that we observe. Secondly, people might think we know things through belief or faith. We simply believe them to be true. They're inherently knowable. And related to that, we might know things by pure reason alone, by logic and the application of the human mind and brain. I'm not going to declare which one is more important than the other, but I hope that what we here share today will give you some insight into, shall we say, the complexities of knowledge and how we know things about the world around us. It sounds deeply philosophical, and I use Aristotle here as my muse throughout our proceedings, because he has a lot to say about what we know, what matters, systems of governance, substance, what constitutes objects, and many other things that he studied as a philosopher. And when I think about how to introduce philosophy to students, I, I always like to use a basic textbook. In fact, this is a great book. It's a collection of the world's greatest philosophers. And inside the book, you'll see there are a number of philosophers, the dates in which they lived, and some of their big ideas. So here we have Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, his significant ideas of uh, the Ubermensch, the will to power. Uh, we have uh, Rousseau, the social contract, for example, and general will. Uh, here's uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, uh, the power of authority, the ends justifying the means, and realism. For those of you who study international relations, you might find that familiar. And finally, Socrates, talking about the dialectic, wisdom, and the Socratic method. So I wonder if I might call on you. What's your name, sir? Aaron. Aaron. I'm going to flick through the book. I'm going to have you just stop me on any page. Stop. There? Stop. Okay, we're going to stop right there. I don't want to see the book. I want you just to look at that book. And I want you to absorb all the information you see there on the page in front of you. There's a quiz in 30 seconds. <laughs> Let me just place that right there. So, Aaron. Have you absorbed the information? You don't have to close the book. Yep. It's an open book test. Great. If I were thinking philosophically about all those philosophers in that book, and you have selected just one, I might want you to concentrate on some of the big ideas, the three ideas that this philosopher is known for. Now I'm getting a very strange sense from you, Aaron. <laughs> I'm going to say one word, and I'm going to ask you if it means anything to you, OK? okay. Wax. He's struggling, ladies and gentlemen. 
<laughs> not sure about wax. Let me just pursue this a little bit further, okay? Um, so uh, there is this, this one philosopher who was troubled about wax. If you, if you imagine a candle on this table you, and you light it, the candle's a solid, but it becomes a liquid. And Aristotle would say, well, you know, what's the constitution of that object? Is it a solid or is it a liquid? And this particular philosopher, I, th I think you're looking at, but it, 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 we'll, we'll get to him in a moment, um, was worried about this. Is it a liquid, is it a solid, and how would we know it's a liquid or a solid at the time? Do our senses tell us this, or is there some other process that we go through? And he thought about this for a while. He sat in his armchair, and he said, if I look out the window, I see a tree. It's about this big. But if I go into the field next to the tree, it's taller than me. And he started to worry that maybe his senses were deceiving him. And if his senses were deceiving him, maybe what he perceived in the world was not true, or at least there was a version of the world that was different from the one that he was perceiving. And he went through something called, or an exercise he called, hyperbolic doubt. Does that make sense to you? Aaron is now smiling. <laughs> this is good for me, right? Because I think I might have accessed some of the inner parts of your brain and your mind, Aaron. Hyperbolic doubt. So what did this philosopher do? He sat and he thought, if I doubt absolutely everything, what's the one true thing I can say? And he came up with this lovely phrase in Latin called cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. The mere act of thinking establishes our existence for this particular philosopher. And that idea of thinking and being suggested that maybe the mind was separate from the body. We call this mind-body dualism. How am I doing? Very well. Spot on. Thank you very much. Now, of course, you're wondering, who is this? Well, he's a French philosopher, early 1600s. Does that make sense to you? Yes. And his name is René Descartes, correct? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, keep the book open. That's great. Have a little look. Is there something else uh, visible to you about this particular philosopher? <coughs> there is. And could you tell us for a moment what that might be? <coughs> it's, uh, about him. An image, perhaps. It's a pendulum. Ah. Pendulum. That's interesting. Placed on the table before I knew your selection, Aaron. I find that compelling indeed. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed that little demonstration. It was interesting, of course, that our student ended up with Descartes, the great French philosopher. And of course, his theory about the separation between mind and body is something that I'm going to explore in the next video.